<clears throat> Good morning, guys. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Good morning. How are we doing? Pretty good. How about you? Uh, hey, in there. So we're getting to the end of the, towards the end of the course. And um, I'm glad you guys are still hanging in there. Um, are there, are there any questions before we get started? Okay, well then, <clears throat> so today, uh, what I have in mind is um, we're gonna do, um, we're gonna do the heat equation. So this is the PD. Um, we're gonna do numerics for this. So we're gonna be looking at, uh, um, we're gonna be looking at um, the um, uh, explicit, Implicit and the uh, Frank Nicholson. Uh, and I, uh, I built some code, so we're going to be looking at, uh, we're also going to be looking at some code here. So this is going to take, we did some of this last time. We've been building up to this for a while. We did some of it last time. We're going to redo uh, some of these bits and pieces. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about stability. Um, and then the second part, so this is going to be after the break. We're going to, uh, we're going to move into the last topic uh, of the class, which is American options. Um, <clears throat> and so, so I talked to Professor Pham uh, yesterday, and uh, so there'll be some overlap with the 6222-622 overlap. Um, but I know, uh, uh, I know that some of you have not seen too much uh, American option theory. So there'll be some overlap. Um, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at um, we're going to look at these uh, sample sheets uh, of um, stubbing time problems. So these sample sheets they don't have much to do with American options. It's just to get some practice on how to manipulate uh, stopping times. I sent those sample sheets to Professor Fem as well. I sent him that last homework number six, which is about American options. So, uh, so at least he can see what, what we're doing in this class year uh, as well. But uh, I don't know with Amy and Alice, you are probably not taking 622. Um, so you will, you will not have seen this continuous time uh, American option theory. Uh, we're going to go through some of it, but uh, N. Young, um, you've been in, uh, you are in, um, you have seen this theory, so, so you'll have to bear with me a little bit. And uh, I should also say that next time, uh, this is going to be a shorter lecture. Yeah, so I have a, uh, I have a conflict. So you can spend, so that, so that'll be, so, so that'll be some extra time. There'll be some extra time for, uh, for homeworks and projects. I'm hoping that you guys have started to look at some of these references uh, that are relevant for, for your project um, choice. Are there any questions before we get started? Oh, wait, can you do a review of Crank Nicholson? Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna start 
and we're not going to start from scratch, but we're going to we're going to redo some of the bits and pieces we did towards the end um, uh, last time. And so we're going to talk about the implicit, the explicit, and then we're going to talk about Frank Nicholson one more time. So you you'll see it again, Alice. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yeah, so it's this Frank Nicholson, this one here. This is the thing that's going to go into your homework five. <clears throat> and this American options, this is this is what homework six is all about. The really neat thing is uh, when you get homework five to work, uh, solving a big part of homework six, it does not require very many uh, changes to your code. Um, so that when we're talking about solving this PDE here using a finite difference uh, to solve the American option, uh, it's not going to require so many changes to your code. Um, so uh, while there's a lot of theory behind American options, the tweaks that you have to make to your uh, finite difference solver, like Craig Nicholson, um, it's not really that substantial. It's just a couple of lines that you have to alter. Um, so we're going to be talking about going to be talking about that. But first, we have to build up the stuff uh, that you need for homework five. Okay, so we're going to start out with the heat equation. We're going to start out with the heat equation. All right, so remember how, how that goes. You, <clears throat> you take a um, take a function u t of uh, b t. U T of B T. Uh, let me call it maybe F. Do F, and then I'll change time in a minute. All right. So if I want this to be a martingale, I apply U to lemma, and I get here that this is uh, uh, this is F. Uh, this is F T uh, plus. This is F T plus, and then you'll have F X X. You have fx db plus one half fxx, and then the conjugation of b is going to be the t. So if you want this to be a martingale, so if ftbt, so for this thing to be a martingale, we need the drifts to be zero. So we need zero to be ft plus. Uh, one half uh, f x x and um, if I want if I want some terminal condition so if I want f t uh, b capital T to be equal to g b capital T for some function this is the terminal condition and so then I need I need uh, g of x to be f at the end. So that's my p, and this is my terminal condition. And then it's it's customary to switch time around. So instead of having a terminal condition, you you get an initial condition. So you can look at u at t x simply to be um, it'll be your f. But then you run time backwards. So you do t minus t and then x. And then this guy will satisfy satisfies the PD. It'll be instead of having a T over here, you're going to get a when you compute the derivative respect to time, you're going to get a minus sign and you move to the other side. You'll get that UT is equal to uh, uh, one half uh, UXX. And then lastly, uh, the terminal condition will now become an initial condition. So you have u at zero x, that's gonna become exactly u g. Right, and this is gonna be true for uh, t positive and x, x is a realization of the rounding motion b, so x is an r. <clears throat> so this here is the heat equation.
So at this point, I'm hoping we, 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 we're familiar and comfortable with this. And of course, we could we could look at variations. Uh, we could look at um, look at um, uh, we could look at more general. Uh, more general uh, heat equations would be of the form, say, u t is equal to a function of t as well as x times u x x. And if we have u zero x is equal to g of x. Or if you want, you can even add a drift. You can have u t plus. Ut could be like a mu t x ux plus uh, sigma. Sometimes you put a square here. Uh, it depends on how you parameterize it. Sometimes you'd like to have a square and then you want to have a half out here. But of course, all this stuff can be absorbed into the function sigma. And you can even have, if you want to, you can also have a source term over here. There could be some uh, some uh, kappa of t and x here. So there's no u dependence over there, and then you'll have some initial condition. So we good so far. <clears throat> so today, so for now, for now we consider. Now we consider a simpler case. We will just have um, we will just have a, a ut is equal to uh, say u x x, and we'll have the initial condition as being g of x. <clears throat> but what we're doing here would also allow us to do extensions like this. One. I like that. So for now we consider a simple case. So you have a second derivative in X and you have a first derivative in T. All right, so what, <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're gonna approximate, we're gonna grid out, we'll create a grid we we'll create a um, a grid. Uh, so we will have points. We we'll create a grid to approximate. Like where are my t's and x's? Well, my t's are positive and my x's are in R. Right, so I'm going to try to approximate, uh, say, an interval from zero to t. This is where my time variable lives. And then I have my R. This is where my X variable lives. We're going to try to, so we're going to create a grid to approximate this uh, this square. Okay, but if I want to have a grid, I cannot have an infinite. The R is, I need to lower the size of R. So this grid here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have some T's. I'm going to have some t's and now I'll have um, uh, I'll have a delta t and I'll have a delta x. <clears throat> so this will be a discrete grid. So I will space out the t variables and I'll space out the x variables with the same spacing. So I'll have these will be the the uh, the distance between the the points in the discrete grid, and then I'm going to have a, I'll have to have I'll have to cut off I'll have cut off uh, levels uh, for x. Uh, I'm going to have them given by um, what I'll call x l and x h, so x low and x high. <clears throat> so if I try to make a picture out of this.
try to make a picture out of this. <clears throat> but this is my x. So I'll have I'll have a grid on the x variable. Okay, so I have xl. Say xl is down here. I say that xh is here. So I'm starting by cutting off the real axis into something like this. And then I'll have space points in between. I'll have xl plus, and then the time step in x is my delta x, and so on. So I'll have a grid like that. Uh, so maybe more specifically, I'll have delta x. I'm going to define this to be uh, xh minus xl divided by, and say my convention is n plus 1. So this will give me, this will give me, uh, this will give me the, the x grid. It'll look like xl, the lower one, then it'll be xl plus delta x, and it'll be xl plus 2 delta x, all the way up until the very end, that will be uh, x, l plus, and then we'll have n plus one times delta x. But if I use the formula, this last point here, this is of course nothing else than x, h. So if we count the points, uh, we want to have uh, n plus two points. Uh, uh, n plus two uh, points here. Depending on what <clears throat> what nodes you're looking at, if you're looking at YouTube videos, there might be a different convention on what is divided by and, and so on. This is the one that that I ultimately have settled on. This here is the spatial variable. This is the spatial. Right, for us, this is the brown in motion variable. Right, that was the one, that variable, that X, here, that X is what is coming from that brown in motion here. <clears throat> so it's sometimes called the spatial variable, and we also have time. Right, so up here, I'm gonna have T. So we also have a time grid. Time variable, so I'll settle on delta t, uh, and this one is going to be the maturity, capital T. Right, so that's that's uh, the length of um, if it's a European option, it's when the European option expires. And then I'll space it out with m. So I have my t grid. It's given by, well, it'll be, uh, the starting point will be zero, and it'll be delta t, two delta t, all the way up to the end, where I'll have m delta t. Right, and of course, <clears throat> this here will be nothing else than t. So on the picture, <clears throat> what I'll have is this is my zero, and then it comes delta t, and so on. And then up here, this is my capital T. So this is my grid. You will have to fill in all these points, and so on. This will be my, that'll be the grid that I'm, uh, that I'm using to approximate what I have over here on the right hand side. And so you can, of course, see that. I mean, you're making choices here with XL and H8, XH. Like, so basic questions are like, how should you choose, how to choose, how to choose uh, N, M, uh, Delta T, and Delta X? How many, how, how fine should your grid be? Where should you make the cutoffs? Well, at least, at least you want, at least you're, 
a numerical outcome. The numerical output should not depend on, it should not depend on these cutoffs. Uh, so the lower cutoff and the upper cutoff. You need to make sure that these are far enough away so that when you run your code, when you're looking at the solution in here in the middle, it should not be sensitive to how far out you cut away Excel and HH. So that seems like a, uh, that's at least one requirement. And it should also be such that when you increase N and M, that is that you lower delta T and delta X, um, you should at least, you, you should converge uh, to the actual solution of the equation. Okay, so I need to create it. So I have my grid and now I need to create the approximation to the actual solution. But before I do that, are we, are we good on how the grid is constructed? <clears throat> So, so the parabolic boundary, so as we call what that is. So on the parabolic boundary, on the parabolic boundary, so remember what the parabolic boundary is, is, is this, the parabolic boundary is where you have, you have your X, You have your upper point and you have your lower point. So here, this is part of the parabolic boundary. This here is part of the parabolic boundary. And then this one here is part of the parabolic boundary. So let me, let me highlight this in. This here is part of the parabolic, this is, and this is. On the parabolic boundary, uh, we we are given uh, use values, right? So, so when I look at uh, u, so at time zero, and then I'm having x varying down here. This is input. This is input for all x uh, between say xl and xh. I'm giving that one, I'm giving you, now T is varying, so that I'm moving up on this boundary. This part here, this was that segment. I'm looking at U, T comma, and then X, L. I know this for any T between zero and say capital T. So that's gonna be this segment. And then finally, when I'm high, you also know what it is. So that's this segment here. <clears throat> These ones here are called um, like there are two kinds, there's the DHA, and then there's the Neumann. These ones here are called DHA, the last two here. They're called DHA. I can spell DHA. These are called DHA boundary conditions. You might see, and we talked about that last time we did American options, you can also see uh, you can also encounter a Neumann, a Neumann conditions. So that will give you here on the boundaries, you will get uh, UX at T XL and you'll get UX T at XH. And you'll have this for any T between zero and capital T for any T between zero. 
<clears throat> so we were last time we talked about this. This year is what would happen with call options. And um, what we're doing up here, this is this works for put options. And as one of you, I think it was Amy that pointed out last time, since we're interested primarily in put and uh, call options, we don't really have to go through this stuff down here because we can use the put call parity that will take us from the puts to the calls. So I'm going to be focusing on these three boundary conditions. Uh, we'll be given what the function actually is on the parabolic boundary instead of having um, instead of having uh, these Neumann conditions where you have to take the derivative. You can also have a mixture, right? You could have a DHA condition on the left, and you could have a Neumann condition on the right. Uh, for example, uh, Neumann to the right. U T X L and U X T X H. <clears throat> so the starting point is that we have gridded out this box, this rectangle, and we are given the values on the edges. And now what we want to do is we want to have a method that will allow us to fill in all the values on the inside. Okay. And so that's what that's what these methods are about. That's what the explicit, the implicit, and Craig Nicholson, this is what they do. They allow us to fill in all the values that are inside, strictly inside the box. So let's talk about how to do that. The, um, so, so we need to get to approximate. So this would be U T X to approximate this for T strictly positive and x strictly in between xl and hx uh, we'll use uh, we'll re recreate what i'll call u <clears throat> and then there'll be an m upstairs and there'll be an n downstairs uh, so here n this refers to the spatial variable So such that such that u m n this is supposed to approximate u evaluated at time uh, t m at the point x n. Okay, so this is the actual solution, and these here are the approximations. Right. So this is the actual solution. And this here is the approximation, and we're going to approximate. We're going to approximate the actual solution at these grid points. Right, so this quantity u here, of course, does not depend upon how we chose the grid. This one here is going to depend upon how we choose the grid because a finer grid is going to give me more, more values on the left hand side. A u does not depend on, that's just the actual solution. And so, how do we do it? <clears throat> well, we have our we have our heat equation. This is the PDE we were talking about. So we have that this is ut. This is the actual solution. This is equal to uxx. So we approximate. We approximate. We replace these things here by uh, these uh, difference quotients. 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 I don't know. Is that how we spell quotients? Difference quotients. So we'll have u, uxx. uxx will be what? Uh, we'll think about uxx as being 
UXX approximated at TM and XN. Right, this is going to be approximated. This is a double derivative. <clears throat> so this will be U, uh, what would be M? So M is fixed. So time is upstairs. Uh, the spatial variable is downstairs. So you have U, M, and then you'll have N plus one. And then you have minus two U, M, N plus U, M, N minus one. Everything divided by delta X squared. So that's the thing that's going to go on the left hand side. And now we also need something to go on the right hand side. And the thing that goes on the right hand side, uh, that's going to be the derivative with respect to time, right? So this here was the second derivative with respect to the spatial variable. We also need the first derivative with respect to the time variable. So we also need ut at tm and xn. How is that going to be? <clears throat> well, you'll have, so now it's in the time variable, so you'll have u, and now we fix the n downstairs. This would be ut, so this would be m plus one minus u n m, and then divided by delta t. So you can see here, um, when I approximate the right-hand side, I, I would have a choice. Instead of having m's here, I could also have m plus ones. I could approximate. I could approximate the right-hand side. Like I'm taking the second derivative with respect to x, so I could choose here whether it should be m or m plus one. So here I chose m, and if I do that, I'm going to get the explicit method. This gives the explicit method. This gives the explicit method. <clears throat> so I take the derivative with respect to time, put that on the left hand side, u m plus one, u m delta t. So now I'm going to put an equality sign. Right? These ones here are approximations because on the left hand side, this is the actual solution. The right hand side is going to be my approximation. So I'm going to put an equality sign here. And I'm going to take this one and copy it down. I get u m n plus one minus two u n m plus u n minus one m divided by delta x squared. So we'll move delta t to the other side and I'll move this one to the other side. I'm gonna get u m plus one at the point n. This is gonna be equal to, I move delta t so I'll get u n m plus delta t delta x squared. And then the mess I will have Everything upstairs is u m n plus one minus two u n m n minus one. And let me call let me call this quantity here the time step divided by the uh, spatial step squared. Let me call this for alpha. And then I can see that I have this term here is both places. This will be uh, one minus uh, two alpha times uh, u n m. And then the other ones will be alpha u n plus one m plus alpha u n minus one. <clears throat> and we're good. We're going to do this for. Um, we're going to do this for n equals one, all the way up to capital N.
and we remember again here so remember i know uh, i know what what happens i know what happens at the uh, left endpoint and the right endpoint like remember that u0 or yeah that's the values on the uh, left side of the parabolic boundary i know what it is over here but right? and i know what it is over here so okay these ones uh, these guys here given So this is how I'll do it. When m is equal to zero, when m is equal to zero, this is how I start out. That's at uh, this part, and then I'll just move forward up through uh, through the domain uh, using the, uh, the situation here. questions on this part. So one can write this system here. You can see it takes three points to create one new one. Like I know all the values at time m. I need three values at time m to get one at time m plus one. So we can write this, we can write we can write we can write uh, this system of equations uh, we can write the system of equations uh, using uh, using matrices. And vectors. Let me try to do that. The matrix that I'm going to be using is a matrix. So I call C. So I have a C. It's going to be a humongous matrix. It's going to have minus twos on the diagonal. And then <clears throat> right off the diagonal, it's going to have ones. And then it'll have zeros. So right off the diagonal, it'll have a one. I don't have a one, I don't have a zero. So it will look like one minus two, one, one minus two, one, and then there'll be zeros everywhere else. You'll have this, you'll have this, uh, it's called a um, triagonal. Uh, matrix, a triagonal a triagonal matrix. Uh, it'll have minus twos on the diagonal and have ones just off the diagonal. And the reason that you see this triagonal structure is because it takes these three values to create one new one. So if you would have had more values on the right hand side, if you would also have like an n minus two and an n minus three or an n plus two and an n plus three and so on on the right hand side, then you would have to have uh, potentially even a fourth or a fifth band of values here. The reason that you get this triagonal structure is because you have three values here. And so we can now write, we can now write the, uh, the explicit method 
uh, becomes um, because I, uh, <clears throat> I need a vector for uh, my use. Uh, so I'll have my vector uh, u and I'll start putting in an arrow on top of it. So my u m plus one, this is going to become <clears throat> It'll be my u uh, one at m plus one. My u two m plus one, all the way down to u uh, n m plus one. All right. So this here is a uh, there are m rows, and uh, there's only one column. So this here is a uh, n. There are, there are n uh, n rows, and likewise, my u my u m. This is a definition. I'm stacking up <clears throat> the same thing except for m plus one. I'll just have m. But again, this here has n rows. So what I'm trying to do is to re-express, what I wanna do is I wanna re-express this system. This is a linear system of equations. So I should be able to express this uh, using matrices and vectors. So let me try to do that. So what are we saying? We're saying that you, uh, the explicit method can then be written it can be written as what? So you have your u on the right hand side. My u m plus one is on the left hand side. <coughs> My u m plus one vector This is the equations that I seek to solve. It will be the identity. So again, I here, this is the identity. So this is the one that has just ones on the diagonal. Everywhere else. So this is an N by N. So it's the identity plus, and then it's this alpha. Alpha is uh, just the ratio between the grid distances. So I plus alpha times the C, that matrix over here, plus UM So that's almost there. The only thing we didn't have to correct for is we have to think a little bit about the endpoints, right? Because when I'm when I'm closer to when n here is equal to one, <clears throat> when n is equal to one, you see on the right hand side, I'm gonna have u zero. And when n is equal to little n is equal to capital N, on the right hand side, I'm gonna have capital N plus one. And that's when you're all the way on the right uh, side of the domain, and I'm gonna have uh, u capital N plus one. So we need to do a little correction here. This is gonna be plus alpha, and then the vector where I'll have uh, U zero uh, at time M. And then I'll just have zero everywhere else. And the same thing, I have to make a correction at the bottom. So here I'll have zeros. And then at the very end, I'll have my u n plus one uh, at time n. That's my explicit method. So I, <clears throat> when you tell me what the initial vector is, uh, that was again when I start out the method. When I start out the method on the parabolic domain, I know what 
what the initial values are. So you give me that one. I just plug it into uh, this machine and then I can calculate the values at the next time step and so on. So that's why it's called the explicit method. There's no need to solve any sort of equations. There's no need to solve any. Uh, yeah. Everything is explicit. The right hand side is known at time m plus one. You just plug it in and you calculate it. Are there any questions about this part? If not, let's try the um, let's try the implicit method, and then Alice, we're we're we're, we're itching towards the uh, Crang Nicholson method. So the implicit method is uh, the change that one has to make. Uh, it is not it's not that bad the the change you have to make is that instead of approximating the double derivative um, at uh, at the left end point you're going to put an m plus one here everywhere you put an m plus one here m plus one here and m plus one here so let's try to do that so the the implicit method The implicit method, <clears throat> so basically just copy paste from what we had up here. You will have the same left hand side. You would have u m plus one, the time derivative approximation. This is now going to be exactly what you had on the right hand side, except we go one up on the m. And then you divide by delta x squared. So that's it. That's the only difference. <clears throat> and then you, you will then solve again for, uh, you again, uh, isolate all the stuff that is known on the right hand side and all the stuff that is unknown on the left hand side. So we'll move delta t over. You will get u m plus one n is equal to. The previous one, which is good because that's the one we know coming in. You move, you move delta t over, <clears throat> and then all the mess. But now it's it's more complicated. Right, this one here is my alpha. As usual, this is this one here is alpha. You see now on the right hand side, I'm trying to create the values at time m plus one. I'm giving the values at time m and I'm giving the values out at the lower points and the upper points. But over here, I also have, I have the thing that I'm searching is also appearing on the right hand side. So I'll move all the unknown parameters to the left hand side, just as before. So here I'll have my alpha. Uh, so I'll have u uh, m plus one n. Then I'll have minus alpha u m plus one n plus one. That was this guy. <clears throat> I'll have minus two alpha. This is going to become one plus two alpha over here. <clears throat> and then I'll have minus alpha u n minus one m. This is everything that I don't know is now on the left-hand side. What I do know is that one guy on the right-hand side. <clears throat> so if you compare, if you compare with what we had before, this is the thing we were hunting, right? And this is all something we know. So it's kind of flipped. I had these three values. I needed those three values to get the next one, but you were already know. Here, I know this one and I can use this one to create uh, these three values. Right? So it's like the opposite direction. But again, what I can do is we can re-express this uh, in terms of a, um, 
in terms of this matrix uh, from before. What would we, how would we write it? How would we write it? Uh, so over here it has, it's this one plus two alpha. <clears throat> Before it was one minus two alpha. So let's move this stuff over on the um, on the right hand side. We have here on the right hand side. So using uh, matrices, vectors. <clears throat> this thing here is now over there. I'll have I minus. Uh, what would it be? Alpha C. And that would be my U M plus one vector. This would be, this would be U M. And then we need to do the corrections for the uh, extremal point. So we need for the boundary points, this would be alpha and then that's before we'll have this U0M. Uh, maybe it'll be U0M plus one, and then zeros. Put an M plus one here before I put an M, and that's because we are looking at the implicit one. But again, as soon as I am on the edges for X small and for X big, uh, these ones are all input parameters. And then here you have the high one. This is n plus one at n plus one. Okay, so this is just these ones are n plus ones, and this is so so for for the explicit. Uh, these are uh, m's. So this is how I would be able to express. Um, this is how I'll be able to express the um, the implicit method. But you see now, what is on the right hand side, right? This is all input, and on the left hand side, this is it's this guy here that I want. So we need to be able to solve this system of equations. So we need to solve we need to solve a uh, system of linear equations. Any questions are coming up to this point? Any ideas on how we how we should solve a linear system of equations? You might it's a special linear system of equations because C has this very nice uh, triagonal structure, right? So it's not like a full matrix here, but it's it's a uh, it's a very particular uh, system of equations that has a has this triagonal structure right inside. So I is of course just a diagonal matrix, but this one here is not quite a diagonal. This is a uh, tri-diagonal matrix. So, so we're going to explore. Uh, we're going to use here that um, that that C is uh, is of a uh, triagonal. Uh, it's of a triagonal uh, type. <clears throat> so the the question is how do you solve how to solve how to solve uh, how to solve a system like m u 
could use M here to do something else. M is the parameter we use to discretize time with, so I should call it maybe um, A, A U. Uh, this was my M plus one. I want this, uh, I have another matrix over here, say maybe I should call it B. B, U, uh, M, and then there'll be some other vector, uh, maybe a, um, a W, uh, M. Like this one here is known, this one here is known, like this one is known, and this one here is known. The last one here, this is the boundary. This is the boundaries uh, from Dirichlet. How would you solve such a system? Well, the first thing that comes to mind The first thing that comes to mind, um, and this one here is a, you will invert, invert A, invert this matrix, right? The matrix doesn't depend on, right? It's just I minus alpha C. There's no, like that C was just a bunch of twos and ones. Alpha was delta T over delta X and I was just the identity. You just invert it. A, this is this is a bad idea um, because uh, A is typically uh, a full matrix. This is not diagonal. It's not a tri diagonal, tri angular. It's not a tri. There's no, there's, uh, there are no zeros, uh, there's no zero blocks. Like C has. But you could do it. It's just, that is not the clever way to do it. The thing that is clever is to use uh, what's called LU factorization. Hang on a second. Okay, guys, you need to be a bit quiet. <clears throat> so we could use LU factorization. So you're going to write. <clears throat> You're going to write A as L times U. Let me call this one here capital U. You're going to use LU factorization. So you're going to write A, this matrix on the left hand side, as a product of two matrices where uh, L is a lower triangular matrix. So it has ones on the diagonal. And then it has zero everywhere else. And then it'll have just off the diagonal, there'll be something, and then there'll be zeros everywhere else. And that would be L. And then you'll have U. This would be an upper triangular matrix. And these matrices, so there'll be stuff on a diagonal. And then there'll be stuff just off the diagonal upwards. And then there'll be zeros everywhere else. <clears throat> so this system here, um, if you factor out L into an LU factorization, because L and U still have a very simple structure, you're not more complicated than A would be because A has this triangular structure. And here there are lots of blocks of zeros. So then the idea would be to solve and to solve, then to solve the system uh, A U equals some matrix B, 
but this would be the same thing. This would be the same thing as writing uh, L U because that was the factorization. You write A S L times U times this U vector. So then to solve this system, you, you solve in two steps. <clears throat> First you solve LV equals to B. Actually you treat this, this one here as a V and then you will do U equals to B. And this is much easier because solving the first system, solving the first equations, you can just have a look at what L looks like. There's just a one here and then there's zeros everywhere else. So it's quite easy to solve the first system. And this is simply because uh, V1, the top element would just be the top element in B. And then you go one step down and you already determined what V1 was. And then the next one is just gonna be one equation uh, that will allow you to determine V2 in terms of, well, V1, you already determined, and then V1 and V2. This here is not computationally difficult. And that's because you're exploring that L and U have these um, uh, particular structures. Uh, and that's coming from A having this particular structure. So we looked at decompositions before. We looked at Kolesky factorization, for example. We also looked at uh, diagonalization of matrices. And so here's another one that's called LU factorization. And uh, <clears throat> if you've never seen this before, it can seem quite overwhelming. Um, so let me just, let me show you, let me show you some code and make it more specific. Um, so let me switch over to showing you guys a little bit of code. <clears throat> So I'm hoping you can see uh, my uh, MATLAB code coming up here. Can you guys see my MATLAB code? Can you guys see my MATLAB code? Yeah, Alice says yes. Okay, <clears throat> I should say that I noticed I noticed a, quite a difference in in viewing the videos. If you're inside Canvas and you click on the link, the quality that's being displayed that's being that that you see using the Zoom uh, using the the Canvas player versus if you go out into the YouTube. And watch the videos directly in YouTube. It's it's quite it's quite different, at least for my computer. Um, and probably some of you already figured this out. Um, but if you're having a hard time uh, seeing some of the, the writing uh, on the YouTube videos, uh, one suggestion could be to try to try to play it directly in the YouTube player instead of going through the Canvas player. Okay, <clears throat> so this here is my. Um, this one here is my uh, little example, and so this is um, this is a um, an implicit uh, solver, and there's nothing nothing new here. The, all the quantities is exactly what we had before. So I'll have um, n. I'll pick it to be nine. Uh, my cutoff levels uh, on the left side and on the right side. So when x is low, it's minus five. When it's up, it's five. And then <clears throat> here's my diagonal matrix. That's that one uh, that we've been that we've been talking about. This um, I minus alpha C, and uh, let me just show you how it looks like. So you can see that we're looking at a tridiagonal matrix, so there are lots of zeros. So your software typically has some sort of a sparse. This is this SP uh, sparse matrix structure that will allow you to uh, uh, compress uh, away all these zeros, and. Uh, what I wanted to show you was just uh, this LU factorization, 
LU is, you know, software presumably also has an LU factorization method built into it. And uh, so let's have a look at how, how would something like this look like in a, um, Oh, this is way too much. I don't want so many. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So <clears throat> I have, um, this is my matrix. And you can see it has this triangular structure. Yeah, so this is the matrix. This is, uh, that's the matrix, the I minus alpha C, and it has this diagonal structure. So outside you have all these zeros. And what the sparse operator does is it basically just gets rid of all these zeros. So you don't have to uh, carry them around when you do calculations. And then the next two matrices are the, um, the LU factorization. So I take the, the top matrix, the guy we're looking at here, and I write it as uh, a product uh, between a, um, and an upper uh, between a lower and an upper uh, matrix. And so the first one that comes out, this is a lower triangular matrix with ones on the diagonal. Okay, so we have ones on the diagonal. And so you see, it, it's a very sparse matrix too, right? There are zeros everywhere upstairs, but there are lots of zeros downstairs as well. So this one here is my L, it has ones on the diagonal. And then this one here is my U, it also has uh, and lots of zeros, right? So it's uh, it's upper triangular on a diagonal. It does not have ones. This is the lower triangular one that has ones on a diagonal, but it has just uh, it's a it's like there's only one of the diagonal uh, non-zero elements in it. So these are the top one is my matrix. That's the triangular one. The lower ones are the LU factorization. Okay, so we got that one. Uh, then we move on to uh, uh, these are the uh, uh, BL and BH. Those are these two corrections for the behavior uh, for x little, for x small, and for x uh, for x equal to xl and for x equal to h uh, xh. The function I'm looking at here is a particular simple one. This is my initial data. It's just exponential of minus x squared. Right, so when x is big, this function is close to zero. So yeah, I, my, um, so my values of u when uh, my values of u when x is small and when x is big are both equal to zero. Okay, and the the solution to solve these linear equations in, in MATLAB is is very simple. Uh, I just iterate and then I use these ul uh, the lower uh, and upper triangular uh, decompositions of the matrix A. And this is, this is the command that does it. So this two-step procedure that I outlined using these matrices uh, U and L, it is, it's not complicated. Um, so <clears throat> if we look at, uh, so keep in mind the, the initial data is this exponential. So it's like this Euler function, the normal density function up to some uh, constant. I don't have this root one over, no, one over root two pi, but other than that, it's just the normal density function. And <clears throat> I'm looking at a one year time horizon. Uh, here I have spatial variables that are just nine. So it's not very many, just so I can print out, so I can print out these matrices. Otherwise, if I have a thousand here, it's going to be a thousand by a thousand. And this is too much to print out and look at. But let me show you how the, the code runs and, and what we get out of it. <clears throat> so these are the pictures, the blue one, um, the, blue, the blue line in, in the graph is, um, is the initial data. And the red one, the red uh, curve, this is, um, this is what you get out. Uh, this is what you get out after uh, taking the blue curve into the heat equation and then running it uh, for uh, one unit of time. And of course, this is there are only nine spatial variables, right? So it's a, I, I should increase the number of spatial variables so I could increase it to say uh, 990. If I do that, I'm going to get a better picture. 
And of course, you need to clear it. Right, so then it looks something like this. Right, so the, the blue curve, the blue curve, this is, uh, this is the initial data. And then the red curve, this is what you get out from running uh, the heat equation for one unit of time. Here we're taking uh, 10 time steps. So we could take 100 time steps and we will see how it changes the, the profile. Uh, it's not going to be easy to spot on your eye. Uh, but this is here is with 100 time steps and 1,000 spatial uh, steps, right? So we have 100 uh, times 1,000. This is the number of grid points we have in the, inside the parabolic uh, algorithm. Are there any questions or comments on, on this part? So you might recall that last time, that last time we talked about something called Richardson extrapolation. And um, so I want to show you how um, it's this trick, right, that allows you to estimate the order of convergence and it allows you to estimate, uh, uh, it allows you to extrapolate to, uh, to a higher position. So I took this example here. And I performed Richardson extrapolation on it. Uh, <clears throat> right, so I need to perform Richardson extrapolation. I need to make up my mind about what point in the grid I'm going to do the Richardson extrapolation. And I picked a half here, so 0 0.5. And then what I did was maybe I should write this down on a piece of paper, just so you guys can. Uh, to see it. This is just what, what's going on in the Richardson extrapolation. So in the example, in that example, uh, Richardson, uh, Richardson extrapolation, and, um, an order, uh, an order estimation, Uh, was done uh, as follows. All right, so you have to fix. You have to. You have this grid. So you're going to fix the point. I fixed the point. I think it was a half. X was a half. T was one. All right. So what I'm interested in is. Uh, I'm interested. I'm interested in varying. So we we vary. We vary. Uh, we vary delta t and delta x. Right, there's only there's only there's only one parameter in which isn't we call it h in which isn't so you have to make up your mind which of these two should you vary. What I did was I settled on I settled on varying uh, I said on varying delta t, and I fixed this, and I fixed delta x. So what I did was <clears throat> I took n to be um, I think nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine, and uh, put delta x to be uh, this was x h minus x l divided by uh, n plus one. This was fixed. And then what I did was I looked at I looked at uh, the values at uh, these grid points for uh, delta t being I think I started out with 100, 200, and it went up to 6,400. Right, so this gave me a sequence of values, approximate values, <clears throat> at these uh, at these two grid points. And then I performed uh, order estimation and I performed Richardson uh, extrapolation. And last time I promised you that this is not difficult. So let me just show you. Uh, let me show you how it looked like when I did it on this code. Here. <clears throat> so 
So this here is my main code. This is, that's the one we've just been running. And you can see here, I'm interested in this point I have. Okay, so in Richardson, <clears throat> the first thing you see is uh, this number here. This is what, what came out of the code when delta t was equal to 100. This is what came out of the code when delta t was equal to 200. This is what came out of the code when delta t when delta t was equal to one over four hundred, one over eight hundred, uh, one over sixteen hundred, one over three thousand two hundred, and one over six thousand four hundred. So what I did was I first estimated the order. Okay, and I first estimated the order, and this formula here this is this is from from the lecture we had last time. Uh, you have this bunch of, of numbers and you can estimate the order uh, using that formula from last time. So if I do that, we'll get, <clears throat> we'll get these numbers here. It's kind of remarkable to see uh, what the order is. Uh, I can even put in more digits <clears throat> and you can see what, what, would, what would the guess of the order be, right? It's, this is a first order method we're looking at here. Uh, it, it comes uh, really out to being something extremely close to one. But you should not expect uh, your numerics to be this well behaved. Uh, I was surprised when I saw that the other day when I, when I wrote the code. So it comes out to, this is a first order method. So now I know what K is. And then I can perform extrapolation. So when we go back, that's why I said the order to be uh, one. Okay, so I extrapolate now. That is, I can take these values I have up here and I can make them better. I, I can extrapolate, I can create a correction curve. And uh, so first we get the order again, and then here comes the new values. So this last number here, this number here, this is gonna be more precise than the last number I have up here. And you can see the, the amount of work that's involved in improving the original sequence of numbers that you have, it's minuscule. It's just a couple of lines of code and you get an improvement. So this is, that's that trick from last time, uh, which is an extrapolation. And here I picked a point, I picked a point a half. I could have picked other points between X L and X H. But this, I just picked half uh, and I got this uh, order of convergence. Are there, are there any questions about, about this little example I had here? So the thing that's a little bit cumbersome <clears throat> when you work with implicit methods like uh, the one we have here is you have to solve this system of linear equations. It is however linear, so it is not that terrible. Uh, and, and the trick here to explore this diagonal structure of your, uh, of your matrix system, you can use this LU factorization. Um, Are there any questions or comments while I have the code up? So you can see the PDE solver, except for setting it up, like all the, uh, the discrete grid and so on, it is really a very simple loop. It, it's like five lines here. <clears throat> this is not, the, the code is not super involved to get this to work. And the same thing with Richardson, this is also not, this is not involved. It's just a few lines of code to get this to work. Are there any questions or can we finally get to answer uh, Al's uh, question uh, more than an hour ago about uh, Craig Nicholson? Okay, then let's, uh, let's try to clarify 
Um, try to clarify uh, Al's uh, question about Frank Nicholson. So this is the last method, and this is going to be the one that we need to use. The one that you need to use in the um, in the homework. So, what page are we on? Page 11. So this is the last method. This is the Crank Nicholson. This is the Crank Nicholson method. So, we have the explicits. And the explicit method this is the one that says that u at a later time is equal to u at the earlier time <coughs> plus the correction. So this is u at, uh, at the earlier time. So this is the approximation for the second derivative, u and then n minus one. That was the explicit. We have the implicit. <coughs> Right here, we, would, we did that, right? We put, we put this as one minus uh, two alpha, u and m uh, plus alpha u n plus one m plus alpha u n minus one m. Again, then the implicit method, it is very similar. The only thing is that this coefficient here has traveled over on the other side. <clears throat> so there we have one plus two alpha times u and m plus one, this is going to be equal to, uh, we also need other things to travel over it. Minus alpha <coughs> u n minus one, m plus one, minus alpha u n plus, n plus one. We wanted that to be equal to uh, u and m, right? So these are the two methods we just went over. So Craig Nicholson says you take half. So the CN method, so this is called CN. Frank Nicholson, this is what we'll call the trapezoid. Trapezoid, trapezoid. You take, you take an average, take half of each. Take half of each and add. <clears throat> okay, so I literally just multiply by half here and by half here, I add them together. This is, uh, this is what we do. So we will have uh, uh, one half u and m plus one plus. Uh, one half <clears throat> times uh, times uh, let's make this a big point to see. times this left-hand side, one plus two alpha, un m plus one, uh, minus alpha, un minus one, n plus one, minus alpha, un plus one, n plus one. That was a half of each of these two. And I take a half, I take a half of the right-hand side, this is one half of the top one, u n m alpha u n n minus two u n m n minus one m. That was a half of the that was a half of the top one, 
and then I have a half of ah, I copy pasted the wrong line. Ah, I should have copy pasted the bottom one. Sorry, guys. It's a little bit better. <clears throat> this is one minus two alpha. Alpha unit n plus one k. Alpha unit n minus one m. And then pause a half of this guy. So there we have it. This here is the um, this is the Craig Nicholson. Uh, this is the Craig Nicholson system, and you can again. This can again be written. This can again be written. Uh, this can again be written as. Uh, very similar to before, like before we had the implicit method, we could write this as like before we had we had this system here. I can write I can write something very similar for the uh, Craig Nicholson and the Craig Nicholson system. When you do that, would become. Uh, I minus, and then it's a half now, alpha C. And then it'll be that vector, M plus one. And then it'll be equal to uh, I, and I think plus a half alpha C. And then it'll be the UM. <clears throat> and then we have the uh, boundary conditions. They show up again, just as before. It will show up here. But now, of course, we took a half of each. So I need a half of this one and I need a half of the one from the explicit. The explicit is the one that just has M's, not M plus ones. So I'll be able to do that too. Put in alpha over two. And then we have a vector and I'll have U M plus one plus U M divided by two. I don't have zeros everywhere else. And here I have zeros. And then last at the bottom, I'll have my u n plus one m plus u n plus one m. This is the Craig Nicholson method for solving um, uh, for solving the uh, the heat equation. And so it's it's again a sim uh, a sim. It's again a linear system where you have a tridiagonal structure. And so you, uh, the proposal is to use this LU factorization uh, to solve. So, and you can again, you can use uh, LU factorization. So you wanna write this I minus one half alpha C. This is a matrix, you write this as L times U. <coughs> so again, factor. Uh, and solve in two steps. So as we made it in the end, this is my Nicholson method. The, uh, I spent more time on the implicit and the explicit. This one here is a convex combination. It's a very simple convex combination. It's a half of each and um, and you might, as we saw in the uh, in the numerics, uh, when we estimated the order of the implicit method, at least as a function of time discretization, this was a first order method. Um, so when you do Craig Nicholson for the uh, for the homework, 
<clears throat> when you do Craig Nicholson for the homework, you, you should be led to something that is, uh, that is not order one. The reason that I did order one in, uh, in the lecture here is because I wanted to show you that there's a difference between um, the Craig Nicholson and the implicit method we already know uh, from um, we already know from uh, uh, the lecture, maybe was it last time or two times ago, when we studied um, when we studied the trapezoid method, that this is a second order method. It's not a first order method. This is a faster method of doing it. And what you should see in your homework is that the Crank Nicholson, this as of when you vary the time discretization parameter, you're going to get, uh, and you use Richardson to estimate. You should get a second order uh, convergence. <clears throat> okay. Are there any questions or comments before we take a little break? All right, then let's take a little break and um, let's take a little break and get back uh, get back together here a little bit after ten o'clock for the uh, for the second half of uh, of today's lecture. <clears throat>